I have a motto, hire fast, fire faster, promote fastest. And yet, I'll be honest here and very vulnerable, I struggle to play that course because for me personally, the emotion of hurting someone trumps the financial impact of it. And where I was able to mature into later in my life was understanding the ramifications it was having on everyone else. It wasn't about me. I really do think a lot of people struggle with the emotional baggage of hurting someone. Vayner Nation, how are you? New episode of the podcast, interviewing some of the most interesting people in the world. I'm excited to do an original show. I know we take a lot of clippings for my keynotes and my runarounds. Uh, I'm in extra good mood because DRock is filming today and some old good feelings. I'm also extremely excited because we have a, a tremendous guest today that I think a lot of you have been affected by. And, uh, and I always think that's super cool when there's uh, someone who's uh, invented or impacted us in a big way. And so I'm going to let Yuri uh, uh, introduce himself uh, and tell you who he is. And then we're going to get into a series of questions and uh, touch on a bunch of subjects here. So Yuri, how are you, my friend? Thank you. I'm awesome. Um, so as you said, my name is uh, Uri Levine. I'm a um, co-founder of Waze, which I uh, see many uh, people use around the globe, actually about a billion. And also of uh, Movit, which is another billion users around the globe. And author of the book, Fall in Love with the Problem, Not the Solution. Yes, I see you. Have, you know, for people that are listening, Yuri's uh, wearing a T-shirt right now. Fall in love with the problem, not the solution. You've been a co-founder in two companies that have a billion people using it, which is just outrageous. Um, would you argue that your passion for the statement that you just made, A, is the reason you've been able to accomplish being involved in those kind of products because obviously you're solving a major problem to get that level of usage. And then number two, if you may, when do you think you started falling in love with the problem, not the solution? Was that something God given? Was that something you were around as a child? Who influenced you? How did you stumble on that concept? So um, at the end of the day, I found myself uh, attracted to problems in a way that, um, that I get frustrated. And I ask myself, is that so? Is that the only way that it can be done? And I try to figure out a solution. Uh, but over the years, what I've learned is that way before you can figure out a solution, what you really want to do is make sure that this problem is actually uh, applying to a lot of people. Right? So think of a problem, a big problem, something that's worth solving, and then ask yourself, so who has this problem? Now, if you happen to be the only person on the planet with this problem, then I would say, you know what, go to a shrink. It's way cheaper <laughs> than building a startup. But if a lot of people have this problem, what you want to do next is actually go and speak with those people and understand their perception of the problem. If they're going to echo back the problem to you, then this is actually a very powerful statement, starting point, because what will happen is that number one, you will fall in love with the problem. Number two, you feel like they are sending you on a mission to actually address that. And when you are in love with the problem, the problem is going to serve as the North Star of your journey, um, which is going to make your journey faster and easier because there will be less deviation of that. And that one is that the story that you're going to tell, way more compelling. Just imagine that we will be here in 2007 and I will tell you I'm going to build an AI crowdsource-based navigation system and you're going to say, yeah, really interesting, but you don't care. If I will tell you I'm going to help you to avoid traffic jams, then you do care. And this is the power of a problem approach or a pro falling in love with the problem that your story is way more compelling. The likelihood of being successful is way more. And at the end of the day, what we really want as entrepreneurs is to create value. If you solve a problem, you create value. You're when, tell, actually, let's take us all the way back because I have a funny feeling we have some similarities in our, uh, in our origin stories. Where were you born? I was born in Tel Aviv, and I was born and raised here in Israel, um, and uh, um, and ended up to be, uh, you know, as a teenager, a troublemaker, really smart one, but a troublemaker. And this turns out to be one of the things that you don't take anything for granted, right? And so people would think of you as a, as a tick or, or someone that is asking annoying and challenging questions. Um, and uh, um, and I grew up in a house that uh, was encouraged me to discover, right? So so if I would come to my dad with a crazy idea, he would say, uh, why don't you give it a try, right? He would know that it's not going to work, but he would say, encourage me to try. And, and there was no judgment if, if it didn't work out because uh, that was the expectation. But the discovery that you fail 
and get up and nothing happened is actually very powerful because it's going to take you throughout your entire life and basically saying, you know what? You, to, to that point, do you feel that micro failures in your youth became foundational to your professional success? Absolutely. Absolutely. And for a second, I would say we as parents, the most important thing that we would like to teach our kids is to fail. There is a you, would you Would you agree with me that we've gone completely the other way in the last 25 years? Absolutely. It looks like it. Right. So, so I, you know, I'm trying to encourage my kids to fail and to expand their boundary and get out of their comfort zone and discover what is it that is going to make them happy. Right. And because at the end of the day, you don't know. Right. I don't know what's going to make my kids happy. No one knows. They okay. need to find out. Right. And the best way to find out is actually go to different places and try to find out. Right. And so. This turns out to be um, very, very important. And I think that as a society, we miss that. We have huge fear of failure that is being, you know, encouraged. The fear of failure is being encouraged, right? Just imagine what's going to happen if, you, if you're going to fail a test, right? If you're going to bring F. I mean, I, I, I could not agree with you more. All my D's and F's in school are foundational to my happiness my lack of anxiety and my professional success. Period. Uh, yeah, not all of them, but most of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got A's in gym because I like sports, but other than that, it looks pretty ugly out there. You when did you when did you think you ha- did you you know we grew up in a generation. You how old are you, my friend? I'm fifty eight. You look great. So I'm forty seven. You and I grew up in a generation where entrepreneurship wasn't almost even a word. It was, you know, it wasn't the culture that we have today. Did you sense that you had that spirit? Did you have a knowledge of what you could do? Did you grow up in an entrepreneurial household? Were your folks entrepreneurs? Or was it something you discovered later in life? So uh, my dad was an entrepreneur and he built factories. You know, this is the entrepreneurship of the previous century. And my mom was a teacher and a professor at the university. And I ended up to be a little bit of both, right? So I'm an mm. on one hand, but also a teacher on the other hand. And this is, by the way, why I wrote this book. I feel equally rewarded when I build stuff myself or I guide someone to build it. And the result is that I have about 10 different startups that I'm mentoring the CEO and coaching them and, and helping them to become more successful. And the book is all about that, right? It's sharing my know-how that will help other people to become more successful. What was the most challenging thing in writing the book? Starting. <laughs> and then how, the journey. How, how long did you debate it before you started it? So, so I think that the foundations of the book was, uh, was uh, laid back in 2016 when I actually did uh, uh, an MBA uh, seminar for building startups and I ended up with pretty much most of the content and then I told myself wait a minute I actually have here a content for writing a book Um, and it was later until my mom told me that I should be writing a book which was the second trigger for that and (laughs) up with uh, COVID that um, you know I found myself um, stuck at home before that I was traveling quite a lot and going to you know, multiple conferences and meeting a lot of people. And then I was ended up to be stuck at home. And I realized that now I have the time. And with the help of uh, Dee Barreel, that was um, really the project manager and the co-editor and the, the, you know, the partner of writing this book, um, we spent about a year writing it. And this is a discovery process at the beginning until you realize, okay, this is how it's going to work, right? Yep. And um, and then you end up with uh, writing the book and realizing that um, you just move one phase in the journey. Now you need to promote the book and make sure that actually a lot of people are reading the book because otherwise the impact is going to be minimal. And I want a bigger impact. I want, at the end of the day, my purpose, my mission is to create value. So the more people reading the book, the more value that I create, and I feel, you know, rewarded. And 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 that's what makes you allocate the work of doing podcasts like this, because you want as much exposure as possible. Exactly. Good for you. Talk to me about the origins of Waze. I just think that so many people here, I'm like, I gen, I actually don't know it. So I'm like excited my darn self to hear what's about to come out of your mouth. How did this company that really, you know, you talk about, 
forget about, you know, I love how you said storytelling because that shows the marketer in you. You know, AI, you know, mapping, fine. I'm going to save you time. You know, I'm going to save you to avoid traffic. Even better story. And then you've got maniacs like me. Hey, I'll save you four minutes in a day. I'll pay anything for those four minutes, which is why I was obsessed with Waze the second it came out. Um, how in the world did that company start? So, so the magic of Waze is that Waze crowdsource everything, right? There is no data coming from anyone else except the drivers. So we crowdsource all the drivers together and we, you know, based on where you are and how fast you're, do- you're going, we know exactly where traffic jams are. If you report that there is a speed cam, which is equally important as, be, as, uh, um, as, uh, um, dry, as finding out uh, or avoiding traffic jams, wow. Um, it's uh, it's reported by other drivers. In the map itself is being generated by the drivers as they drive. Right? If you drive somewhere, then I know that uh, it's drivable. Um, the idea came to my mind back in 2006 when we were, um, as a family, we were at a family gathering up the northern part of Israel. This is, Israel is a small place. It's about the same size as uh, Massachusetts, right? And, uh, um, and uh, we were like 10 cars there. And when it was the end of the, the weekend, we drove home. We at the time had four little kids. So it took us longer to uh, arrange everyone and, and gather everyone, put them back into the car. And everyone already left. And, and there were back then two routes, two alternative routes going from the northern part of Israel back to Tel Aviv. And I um, called up all of the other cars and asked them, how is traffic like on your path? And what I found out is that in one route, it's actually pretty okay. In the other one, it was really crowded. And I realized that what I really need is someone ahead of me on the road to tell me what's going on. And that was an idea that I was trying to promote um, with different partners, and it didn't work out until 2007 when I met my other co- co-founder, um, Amir and Ehud. And... Um, and we actually shared a vision. Now, what it turns out is that the hood was already in a process of building a prototype of um, crowdsourcing the map data, which was mandatory part of that. And then yes. we decided that this is what we're going to build. We're going to build ways, and we're going to help drivers to avoid the traffic jams, and we're going to focus on the drivers on their daily commute. So the use case is very different. And the result is that, you know, if I would ask today drivers, how often do you use Waze? They will tell me every day, right? If I would ask people that are using Google Maps, how often do you use Google Maps? They will tell me when I need it, right? And, and the need for Waze is actually on the daily commute. And we started the journey in 2007, and the first version of Waze was running on a PDA. Remember? Yeah. Long, long time ago, there were dinosaurs, and then yes. PDA, and then Nokia phones, and we today all have iPhones and Android, right? This is 15 yeah. years. That's it. And uh, um, we raised... At that, pro- point, at that point, people forget that are very young. There was that, those gremlins, right? Those plugins that you'd put into the... And it was, that was really kind of that, the play pre the iPhone. The Garmin, not the gremlin. The Garmin, Garmin or the Tom Toms of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom Tom. They were... The use case was when you go to a place that you don't know how to don't get. Know. And we turned that around by basically saying, you know what, we're gonna create, uh, we're gonna help you to to save a few minutes every every day, right? And occasionally a lot of minutes, right? Because if there is All an right. accident or something like that. But Major. As it ended up, can I ask you a quick question? I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is how my brain works. Why do humans? even when Waze is telling them the right answer, decide, I can't wait to hear your take on this. It is unbelievable watching humans when the data is so profound that they still have to go some other way as if they feel like they know better. So in most cases, they simply don't pay attention. They simply don't pay attention. They, you know, they, they, this is the, the route that they're taking about people like D-Rock who are just stubborn and think they know better? What about those? Well, there there are some- people like that. Obviously, there are always people like that, right? Yeah. And, uh, and some, some actually told me that they are actually competing with Waze every day and they, <laughs> they, they, they there is a fastest route. Um, <laughs> in general, I would say it's possible, but less likely. 
Um, and, and so we ended up with, uh, and this is really interesting, right? We started Waze and the tagline of Waze was uh, outsmart traffic together, right? So, so outsmarting is the most important thing, right? But as it turns out over the years, people don't necessarily take the fastest route. What they really care about is the, the how long it's going to take them to get there. And the, the certainty versus uncertainty is the major value that Waze is actually creating for most people. So you know exactly when you're going to get there, and that's it, and it's not a big deal. Um, and so we started the journey. We raised capital 2008. We built the first version on smartphones. We um, went to the market at the beginning of 2009, and that was in Israel, and it was actually pretty good. And then we, beginning of 2010, we tried to make it available everywhere, and it was not good enough. And this is where the realization that building a startup is a journey of failure is coming from. You know, it doesn't work. And, and you speak with the drivers, they tell you that it doesn't work for them. You build the next version, you know that this is it, and yeah. it's not. So you're doing it all over again. You speak with the drivers, you understand where the problems are, you build the next version, you know that this is it, and it's not. Iteration after iteration after iteration, more than a year of iterations until it's become good enough. And so today, when I define when I define building a startup as a journey, then I will define three dimensions to this journey. The first one is going to be a roller coaster journey with ups and downs and ups and downs. And look, if you'll tell me all the businesses in the world have ups and downs, I agree. But the frequency of those when you're building a startup and the amplitudes are way higher. I think that I heard the best quote from from Ben Horwitz. Ben Horwitz is one of the founders of Adresen Horwitz, a venture capital firm. And before that, he used to be a CEO of a startup. And he was asked whether or not he was sleeping well at night as a CEO of a startup. He said, oh, yeah, I slept like a baby. I woke up every two hours and cried. And that's <laughs> really the reality of the roller coaster journey. The second part of the journey is going to be a very long one until you figure out product market fit. And product market fit is when you bring value to your users or to your customers. And if you don't figure out product market fit, you will die, as simple as that. Yep. In fact, you never heard of a company that did not figure out product market fit. They simply died, that's it. Has never, never, never happened. Um, actually on that point, because I see this here, I want to get to this because we're going to run out of time. When, you know, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. These are things that you touch on. We just talked about it, how to figure out product market fit, which is huge. And I think, to be very frank, 90% of people are, are naive about that truth. They would like to see something exist, but they've given, they've given no humility or curiosity to the product market fit. So I love that you touch on that. Then you talk about how to determine your business model and, and lock down your growth plan. You also talk about the key components of building a successful startup that will disrupt broken markets, which I love because you've scratched that itch. I'm gonna let you jump into which one you want here, but I just wanna touch on this for the people that are listening if they're considering the book. And I have good news for Yuri. This was a good use of your time. This audience loves reading books, so you're gonna be very happy with me when you see the data on Amazon after this podcast airs. Awesome. Um, the, this one I love. The importance of firing and hiring the right people. Yes, in that order. I have another, uh, I'm really excited to see that. Deciding when to sell and how entrepreneurs can prepare for the eventual exit of the company. That's super interesting because you guys only ran ways for how long before you sold to Google? Um, about six years. Officially, Not, five years. Really short yeah, period. Very short period of time. Uh, and then the importance of paying it forward and guiding others, uh, entrepreneurs in need, which I love so much. And I love that you end with that. W w of the things that I just brought up, which was really a primer for the audience in case I didn't get to it on things you can expect from the book. I still believe books are one of the best ROIs in the world. When I think about the people that write books and I think about the effort they put into it and I think about all that information costing about 20 bucks, I still think it's one of the great ROIs that exist. Of the things that I just brought up that you touch on in this book, which one would you like to double click into and speak on a little bit? So let's uh, double click into firing and hiring. This is really interesting. And we will double click on more. And then, you know, if you'll give me the rest of the evening here in Tel Aviv, then we will spend the rest of the evening here. We've got seven minutes. So, like, you know, that's how it's going to really play out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so one of the challenging things is that um, I spoke with many entrepreneurs that their startup failed. And I asked them, why? What happened? 
And about half say the team was not right. And I kept on asking, okay, what do you mean the team was not right? And what I heard the most is, you know, we had this guy not good enough and this guy. So not good enough was the main reason. Another reason that I heard often is that we had uh, communication issues, right? Something that I actually called uh, ego management issues. And then I asked them the most interesting question. When did you know that the team is not right? All of them knew within the first month. Within the first month. Wow. And said, wait a minute. If you knew within the first month that the team is not right and you didn't do anything, the problem was not that the team was not right. The problem was that the CEO did not make hard decisions. Making easy decisions is easy. Making hard decisions is hard. This is why most people don't like to make them. In a small organization like a startup, it will go all the way to the top to the CEO to make those. Now, if the CEO doesn't make those decisions, this is where it's becoming complicated. Right? Yes. And the reason is a simple, right? Startup is a small organization. Just imagine that you're in a small organization, 10, 20, 30, 40 people, and there is someone that shouldn't be there. Everyone knows. Yes. Everyone knows, and the CEO doesn't do anything. That's where the, the, the nature it's of it is. It's a crusher. <clears throat> exactly. And then what happened? The top performing people would leave. Yep. They become and demotivated. Because they don't want to be in an organization that is unable to make hard decisions, and they have a choice. Now, if you have people that shouldn't be there and the top performing people are leaving, that's the beginning of the end for you. There's right. no way that you can recover. One of the major conclusions of the, of the chapter firing and hiring is, look, if you hire someone new, if you are a hiring manager and you hire someone new, Mark your calendar for 30 days down the road and ask yourself one question. Knowing what I know today, would I hire this person? Now, if the answer is no, then fire them immediately. You're doing yourself a favor, the rest of the team a favor, the organization a favor, and that particular person, you're doing them a favor because they're not going to be successful here. You already set that trajectory because you don't think that you should have hired them. And the reality is that if you don't act, Everyone else knows, and they see that you don't act. And this is really, really important. In general, I can say that for everything in your life, right? Knowing what you need today, if you're going to do, if you would do something different, then do something different today. If you basically tell yourself, no, 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 I'm going into the wrong path, then stop and change, right? Because today is the first day. Why, why, the why, do, you, why do you think most people struggle with making the tough call? Because it's hard. Because you need to live with the consequences. Because what if I'm wrong? Now, this is really interesting. I spoke with my CEO in, in my team that had to release someone from the management team, right? So obviously, if this is an employee somewhere else, then they don't even know about it. But the management team, right? And ask them, when did you fire this person? The answer was always the same. Way too late. Yeah. In, you know, in, it's funny. I have a I have a motto: fire, you know, hire fast, fire faster, promote fastest. Agreed. And yet, and yet, I'll be honest here and very vulnerable. I struggle to play that course because for me personally, the emotion of hurting someone trumps the financial impact of it. And where I was able to mature into later in my life was understanding the ramifications it was having on everyone else. It wasn't about me, but I was, you know, at the time I was in my early twenties building my father's business. And I, and really even into my late thirties, I really struggled with it. And even today, my last book, I called 12 and a half and it talked about these traits that mattered. And I spoke about the half, which mine was candor. And it was a struggle for me. It's why it was only a half. I still needed to get to a full. I really do think a lot of people struggle with the emotional baggage of hurting someone. I agree. I'm just saying it's the, actually the other way around. So let me say the following, right? Yeah. If you're going to hire someone, you are going to have sleepless nights. 100%. It's painful because it's hard, because it's hard decision. And you're afraid that you're going to hurt someone. And we don't want to hurt others. In no. particular, someone that we just hired or someone that is with us, right? But the reality is that you are hurting them when you are not. I believe that. They I believe that. I believe they, because, because they're living in a fake environment. They deserve to be successful, but they're not going to be successful. Correct. 
They're, they're working in a fake environment. You've, and, you've, read, you've already killed them, but they're a dead man walking. Exactly. And this is why I'm saying when you hire, mark your calendar for 30 days down the road and then make the decision because that decision is going to be way less painful if you let it drag for a long period of time, right? If you let it drag for a long period of time, then everyone is becoming vested into that. If it's only a month after that you hire them, it's easier for you and they deserve to be successful. Now, the most interesting question, uh, the most interesting answer about this question is when you ask yourself, would I hire this person? And the answer is yes. This is the time to go and tell this person that they exceed your expectation, that you are very pleased with the fact that they have joined the organization. And if you can do any sort of demonstrating that, for example, giving them more equity, that's exactly the time to do that. Because this is where you establish the trust and the loyalty with someone that you basically just say that you're very happy with the hiring. Yeah, I love that. Yuri, in our, in our last minute or two here, anything you want to touch on? Um, so, you know, I, I'm going back into, uh, into product market fit and into understanding users. Um, we tend to think that we are uh, the typical user. And we are actually an amazing sample of one person. That's it. And if we want to build something that will be applicable to billions of people, to everyone, then we need to understand that not all the users are the same. And they are different users and they have different types of behaviors and they might be using the product differently and capture the value differently. And the only way for us to find out is to actually watch users and then ask them why. And so perhaps the most important part in the journey of trying to figure out product market fit is watching users and asking them why, why you have done it this way and not this way, why you didn't do this and, and so forth. So you can understand and improve your product. I love it. My friend, I am. Uh, I really enjoyed our time together. Congratulations on your success. I've known of you and your successes from very, very far away. We've never had the chance to interact. I, I easily said yes when this crossed my desk. I want to support your book. My intuition is that it's going to be valuable for a lot of the readers that are listening to this. And I wish you nothing but happiness and success. Thank you. Same here. Cheers. Cheers.